Well, a very good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Adrian Reed. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, which is entitled, Are You Solving the Right Problem? Now, I suspect whether you're a business analyst, whether you're a project manager, a business architect, or whatever, you, you've probably all come across situations where stakeholders have jumped on a solution. And they've wanted to progress that solution without really understanding the problem. And in fact, you may well have worked on projects where that sort of thought pattern has happened and it tends to lead to quite negative outcomes in many cases. So I'm really, really pleased to um, have James Robertson uh, speaking on the web webinar this evening. I'm sure many of you will, will know James through either his courses or his books or other work and webinars in this area. Um, James has been associated with hundreds of systems projects. He's the author of books and seminars on requirements and solving the right problem. And his experience with agile teams has given him unique insights into requirements and how they work in the agile world. Um, James is actually co-author of six books now, including Business Ana Analysis Agility, uh, which came out earlier this year. I'd highly recommend you check that one out if you haven't seen it already. And of course, the classic uh, Mastering the Requirements process. So with a presentation entitled, Are You Solving the Right Problem? Seven Rules for Getting It Right. Uh, James, over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to start by apologizing for my voice. I've picked up a throat infection and my voice is even more croaky than it normally is. And so I'm just going to have to ask your indulgence for the next 40 minutes while I talk to you. I do apologize, but um, I can't schedule a throat infection, unfortunately. I'm going to start with uh, what Adrian was just talking about. Too many projects fail because they don't solve the right problem. Um, I'm also thinking about startups failing because they don't solve the right problem. We know that about 40% of startups fail, almost all of them, because they have produced a product that didn't address a problem that anybody had. And I suspect the number for IT projects is probably more than 40%. Uh, do not deliver something that solves the right problem and either are abandoned or the team have to go back and extensively rework or extensive rework goes on during the delivery process because they hadn't come across the right problem. Now, Adrian is talking about starting off with an assumed solution. I came across these two stories. As a user, I can search for a job. As a company, I can post job openings. Now, these are assuming solution, assuming a solution. They're lazy stories, possibly written by developers. As a user, I can search for a job. Well, I'm sorry, if you're looking for a job, you don't want to search for a job. You want to find a job. And it's really quite a different thing. The problem is finding the job. A company, I can post job openings. That's not solving the company's problem at all. Uh, the company wants to have a very limited number of people coming along for the interview, but only qualified people coming along for the interview. These stories suggest that anybody can search for a job and then rock up for the interview and waste the employer's time. So these are nowhere near solving the right problem. Um, I doubt anybody listening to me is old enough to remember the Microsoft Kin. There's actually two Kins. I picked this one because it's the ugliest. Uh, this was a device released by Microsoft some time back. It was meant to be a social media device where people could uh, be on Facebook, Instagram, My, uh, um, MySpace uh, that used to exist and so forth. And after three months, they pulled it off the market because they'd sold about four editions of it. It failed to solve the problem in as much that they had not anticipated what people really wanted to do with these devices. And they, <laughs> bizarrely, um, sent out the post. If somebody put a post onto um, Facebook, uh, it wouldn't go out for several hours. And so it, it 
completely defeated the point of having this device. So naturally enough, it got it got pulled. Let me give you another example of, of trying to solve the wrong problem. Long queues at supermarkets. We've all been in this situation. You stand there. And for some reason, as soon as we get to that queue, we become incredibly impatient, uh, even though we've possibly loitered around the supermarket for some time. Now that we want to leave, we want to leave in a hurry. And this particular supermarket's having complaints uh, that there are long queues. So the IT department want to build a new point of sale system. Now, the point of sale system is what happens when managers switch into solution mode. This is the IT, the point of sale system is what they want to build, uh, what they think they can build, what they think is in their sphere of influence to build it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. I mean, why do supermarkets have long problems? Um, it could be there's simply not enough checkouts. It could be the checkout people are too slow. Uh, it could be very awkward at the checkout point that people have got to handle their groceries far too many times to get out. Um, it could be that the lines are actually long, but they move quite quickly, uh, but people still see a long line and complain about that. Um, perhaps the supermarket's unpleasant, the environment's unpleasant, people don't want to wait. Uh, perhaps they're playing music that supermarket customers don't like. Uh, I've experienced this quite a few times. Um, and it makes the wait seem excruciatingly long because you're being bombarded with um, music that you really, really, really don't like. So you might also, um, think about if people are perceiving the lights, lines are moving too slowly, perhaps you could divide it up. Perhaps this is caused by um, people taking too long in front of you. you. You know this feeling. You get into a queue, you get close to the checkout, and suddenly there's an octogenarian or a nonagenarian couple at this checkout and they're taking so long to do everything and they insist on paying in cash and they're counting it out to the last penny and they're going through each other's purses and pockets to find the right money and it takes forever. These people are wanting this to take a long time. Why don't we have a, a slow lane and people who don't care how long it takes can get into the slow lane and let everybody go through. Anyway, I'm gonna come back to this problem uh, just a little bit later because um, I point out that the IT system is um, not necessarily the right pro solution and could well be not the right solution. So the first of the seven rules is don't start with a solution. I think you're all expecting that. Uh, here's somebody saying, I need a mobile app where I can swipe through deliveries straight into a solution. Okay, we don't know what the, what the problem is. So we have to, the first thing we have to do is to say, there's a difference between a problem and a solution, okay? And simply because somebody comes up with a solution does not mean they know what the problem is. And it doesn't mean you know what the problem is either, unfortunately. Scrum starts with a backlog. Um, I've read this too many times. People build this backlog. Uh, and this one is already arranged into sprints and releases and all the rest of it. Uh, nice, nice stuff, except all of these stories here are solutions. They're things that people are going to build. They, there's nothing on this. You can't read it on your screen, probably. It's a type of, well, I actually blew it up and looked through it. There's absolutely nothing on there to do with what problem they're trying to, uh, trying to solve. So rushing into a um, solution like this by building a backlog at the beginning uh, is going to be problematic. We do, of course, have to build the backlog no question about it, but we should be building the backlog when we have a knowledge of the problem we're trying to solve. So rule number two is don't assume the solution. Here's somebody wanting to reach a larger audience. A bright young man says, oh, will you soak a social media for that? I'm a really good whiz at social media. Um, you'll also notice the other slight effect that when people are good at building one kind of solution, they tend to see that as a solution to everything. Anyway, this is an assumed solution. Um, <clears throat> it does seem simple. The lady wants to reach a larger audience, but is that really the problem? 
does he want to eat a li reach a larger audience or reach a better audience? Because reaching a better audience would be reaching people more likely to buy whatever it is she's selling. So the social media solution is assumed and might not solve the right problem. Instead, I'm going to su suggest to you, because you will be given assumed solutions all the time. You know, project leader rushes in, so we're going to build a, a web app. We're going to build a, a add-on to our website. We're going to build an app for this. We're going to build a database, whatever. You have to examine it and say, why? What are you trying to achieve with it? And the first thing I would suggest all the time is eliminate any technology, any technology in that. Sort of scrape off the technology and say, what's left? What is the underlying problem that this technology solves? Is that the right problem to look at? Uh, I refer to this underlying problem as the essence. What is the essence of it? If I did not have to take into account technology, uh, what's it going to be doing? If I could peel away the computers and the people and the organization and everything else, what I'd be left with is sort of the, the pure policy or the essence of the problem. You're asking what is it doing, not how it's doing it. I'm not concerned at this moment with the technology because it's probably cluttering up and, and um, hiding, disguising the real solution. So a suggestion here for assume solutions because you may have some little bit of a project problem to uh, overcome here. Write what you think the problem is and circulate it and see if you can get agreement on it. Because sometimes you'll find, and I've done this several times, you write this down, you give it to everybody in the project, you give it to managers and everybody else and say, that's the problem that we think we're solving with this proposed solution. Are we right? Are we solving that problem? And people will very quickly tell you if they think you've got the wrong problem. This lovely quote from Albert Einstein, if I had an hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute finding a solution. Um, I really wish all companies behaved like that because uh, we would get much better solutions uh, if we properly defined what the problem was. Which brings us to rule number three, don't start with a solution, start with what you actually know. Now at the beginning of a project, what is it that you know? You possibly know the deadline, but that was just made up by your manager. What you actually know is who the customers are. It's the only thing you've got concrete information about. What it has to do, what problem it's solving, and everything else is really not firmly known. So I suggest that we start with the customers because they're the people that have the problem. So I'm talking to my customers and I'm talking about their aspirations, their values and needs and fears and so forth. And the more I can talk to the customers, the more I'm going to understand them and understand their problem. But a question I'm always going to be asking is, why is it important to solve their problem? Um, why is it important that they have this solved. Is it good for you? Is it good for them? Is it going to bring about some uh, mutual benefit uh, by solving this, this problem? Rule number four, following hard on the previous one, is talk to the real customers. Now, the reason I want to talk to the real customers is a lot of the time I am talking to surrogates. I'm talking to um, customer representatives and so forth. And a lot of the time they tell you what they think the customer wants or what they themselves want, but it's not necessarily what the uh, customer wants. Uh, I recall a project I was doing as one of the London boroughs in the West of London. And this was the part of it that was in care looking after old people. And they provided a food service. Meals were sent out to these people. And when we got to talk to real customers, we found something really startling that a couple of old guys said to us, well, you're spending all this money on us bringing us food. Why not just give us the money? We can go off to the pub and get some fish and chips and be perfectly happy. So talking to the real customers, we found a much better solution. Now, the origin of the problem is, well, the very beginning of it. Uh, take this situation. 
I've got a person with a problem, a call sees she phones a call center operator, uh, and the call center operator has some software. Now, if the organization is there, organization boundaries there, this is not your customer. This is not your customer because uh, your customer's way out here and your problem is really way out here. So finding out why that computer failed uh, would be beneficial to you. Uh, over, overcrowded dogs homes, getting to the origin of this. Uh, this story comes, a lovely story, comes from um, a lady in uh, Los Angeles where about three million dogs a year uh, go into shelters in the United States and about one, about half of those are adopted. And so all of the shelters run programs to, uh, you know, promoting the idea of adopt a dog, adopt a dog and so forth. And a lady called Laurie Weiss started questioning people as to why they were bringing dogs in. And she found out a lot of the time, and this is uh, Los Angeles, remember, a lot of the time it was poverty that the people had a dog and the city council had said, oh, you've got to have a rabies shot or something like that. And they just couldn't afford the 20 bucks for the rabies shot. And so uh, the dog shelter started giving money to these people or simply giving the dog a rabies shot and the certificate uh, or giving them a license or whatever they've got to do. And the number of, because most of the people, 75% uh, of the people actually wanted to keep their pets. And so she solved, she found the real problem was not, how do I get dogs adopted? Uh, but how do I stop the dogs from coming into the, uh, into the dog's home? Rule number six, break away from the assumed solution by generating alternatives. I'm gonna suggest that uh, when you are confronted in a project that you generate as many projects as you possibly, many alternatives as you possibly can, not many projects. Now, these are sketched out at the moment, remember. Uh, I'm only sketching them because I want to show that there are other solutions to it, but I'm going to explore each solution because maybe I can find that there is a better solution or maybe I can find that I'm not really solving the, uh, the, right, prob uh, the right problem. So I'm going to use this thing called safe to fail probes and for each of the candidate solutions, I'm not committing to any of them, and keep in mind it's probably just a sketch, a screenshot, a two sentence description of it, a small process model or something like that. I ask about outcomes, I ask about value, is it solving the problem, is it the right problem to solve? Because sometimes I can go back and say, uh, do we have to solve this problem? Is this uh, thing going to actually uh, bring about some benefit to you? Um, for example, here as an example of a probe, uh, I've built a storyboard and I've got the first panel uh, customers in the um, bookstore cafe. Uh, she finds a book she wants to have printed. It's not in stock in the bookstore. So she sends it off to the cloud and that downloads the instructions to the uh, espresso binder, espresso printer. These are things that'll print and bind books on demand, does it in about five minutes. Uh, and then she goes to the cash register and pays for it. So we start probing and say, uh, are they used to doing this? Would they do it? Um, how many, uh, can we print big books? No, they're only up to 450 pages. Uh, the cover quality has a problem here. Uh, we need modified software in the cash register. Is that going to be viable or not? So this is the kind of probe we're doing. Uh, and all the time going back to the customer and saying, well, this will provide you with a solution. Is it providing the right solution to you? Is it solving your right problem? Uh, here's our supermarket one again. The point of fail system when we probe it uh, comes up 5% faster, cost half, half a million. Self-scanning at the checkout, 10% better throughput, winning already, but it costs 750,000. Maybe we don't want that one. In-store handheld scanners, 12% better throughput, cost 250,000. Now this is looking pretty good. And the note saying customers will accept this, uh, meaning we've tested it on customers and they think, yes, it's okay to uh, to do that. Uh, we could put RFIDs or near field communications on everything, uh, vastly expensive, 750,000 a year, not worth it. The increase in, in speed will be maximum, but uh, we can't do it. Or we could change the queuing system uh, at a cost of thousand um, pound. What we could do is just have one line and they branch off to uh, go to the first available checkout queue. We find that's uh, very low cost. All we've got to do is buy some of those barriers you see at airports. 
uh, and we increase throughput by 5%. So the probing then is demonstrating solutions to customers and asking questions like, how does it solve your problem? Is this producing the right need? If you get the outcome, uh, what advantage? Uh, are we really solving the right problem and prompting them, using these solutions to prompt them about re-examining their, uh, their request for a solution? Systemic thinking, this is something near and dear to Adrian's heart. Uh, let's say I've got a new solution that I plug in down the bottom here, this yellow one's just appeared, and it sends some data on the orange flow to the next solution, which sends on something else, and then it breaks the one at the top. It turns red because it's now broken. And the idea of systemic thinking is not about what happens next, but what happens after that, and after that, and after that. Okay. And that's something we have to do when we're probing to say, uh, we don't just want an output, we need to know an outcome and further down the line. Double loop learning uh, comes from the idea that we start off, as we show here, with the essential business problem and experiment with the candidate solution. Uh, we do what I was just talking about, probing at the solution, asking the questions and so forth, and looking at the results. Now, if the results say this doesn't work, we go back, we try a different solution. Adjust the experiment by, by trying some uh, different solution and we do it again. We test again, we exper experiment again. Now, double loop learning says, instead of going back and getting a different solution, we go back and we question the problem and say, it hasn't worked. Is that because we've come up with the wrong solution? Or have we not understood the problem? And by not understanding the problem, we've not been able to produce a solution that's going to uh, solve that customer's problem. So rule seven, my final rule, and this is the one I really, really, really want everybody to go away with, is step back. Whenever you are confronted with an assumed solution, uh, whenever anybody rushes in, said, oh, we've got to build a database to this, we've got to build a new uh, couple of sections in our website, step back, step back and say, well, what is that going to do for us? And the further you step back, the more you can see the broad picture, you more can see the, the outcomes of your actions, uh, the more you see the results of your actions. And so it pays, <sighs> You don't actually have to get up from your desk to step back. You've just got to mentally step back. But it, uh, it does help if you uh, take a refreshing view by standing back from the actual problem. Because all, most of the time, we get too involved in our solutions and we don't stand back long enough in order to see whether we are, in fact, solving the right problem. So just to summarize that before I uh, take your questions, we start with the problem. And I'm gonna suggest firstly, try reframing the problem. Try putting it down in a different way to see if, if you can change it in some way or whether you've actually understood something. And then asking the questions, how might we, how might we solve this, uh, this problem? And from that, generating a number of candidate business solutions. Now, these candidate solutions are going to include, of course, the assumed solution you were presented with at the first, but a number of alternatives. Now, we take each of the alternatives. Now, I mentioned here, you don't take very long doing this because you're not building actual solutions. You're not writing software here. Unless you can write a few lines of code that'll, that'll do something. But it's a very, very sketchy um, idea of a solution. And then you go into your safe to fail probes. Once again, with the customers, you're testing these candidate solutions with the customers to say, what effect does it have on them? What effect does it have on their business? Uh, what effect does it have on the real world? What effect does it have uh, for the people involved in the solution. And then asking the question, do I have to fix the solution because it didn't quite solve the problem? It didn't quite produce the desired outcome? Or can I take it back to the original statement of the problem and saying, is this the right problem to be solving? Uh, because if this is solving the problem, 
uh, it's producing a result that we really don't uh, don't want. And so we've probably come up with the uh, the wrong solution. Finally, finally, and this does not take long at all, uh, you get to select the best option. And the best option is simply the one that solves the right problem. So that brings me to the end of the prepared material. Uh, I'm just going to jump in very quickly with a blatant commercial for my new book, Business Analysis Agility. And my connection details are down the bottom. If you wish to get in touch, I'm very happy to um, answer any questions you might have. So uh, that was very, very quick. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time um, with one another. So if you have questions, I think Adrian, you have a list of things. Yes, absolutely. So I can see the questions are coming in uh, thick and fast, which is, is always an extremely, uh, extremely good sign. So um, we'll take as many questions as we, as we can. So the first question is, uh, to what level of detail do we need to, or to what level of detail do we need to generate our alternatives? The answer is not very much. Um, and my rule is if you, can, if you can use whatever you've generated to explain what it does to somebody else, that's enough. So it might be, as I mentioned, a process flow. It could be just a, a sketched screen uh, showing some capabilities. Um, the elevator pitch uh, is, is one of my, you know, the expression meaning you don't go into very much detail at all. So something you can do quickly and don't put ego into it because you're now trying to test it to destruction. Yeah, so almost just the essence, the, mm. the edges of the solution in, in a way. So, um, okay, our, our next question is around um, taking these ideas and convincing people. Um, uh, so I'll sort of paraphrase it because it's quite a long question. It's, it's essentially around what if, uh, you know, what if someone is wedded to a solution and we want to convince them to take that step back? Do you have any practical tips on how to convince people that they even need to take that step back? Um, yes, I do. If you can, if somebody's, uh, like, you, you see this all the time, it's a very, very common problem. If somebody is wedded to a solution. Um, they're married to it and divorce is going to be very, very difficult to bring about. Um, by proposing alternatives, you might be able to demonstrate that something is uh, slightly better, uh, but also by intensely probing the proposed solution to see does it bring about all of the, um, the right outcomes. Because if you can show that it doesn't actually solve the problem, I think you're well on the way to uh, convincing somebody. Um, the other thing is that sometimes uh, it's a bit like, I don't know, religion and politics. It's, it's what people believe and it's very, very hard to shift those beliefs uh, and logic is not necessarily going to do it. But I think by demonstrating that the proposed solution is the assumed solution is not producing the outcomes needed, I think that is the, um, the strongest way of, of uh, getting people away from their assumed solution. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually show them the impact of, of, of mm -hmm. pressing ahead and, 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 and selling the benefit of, of, well, we might find something cheaper, quicker, slicker, better. Um, so, okay. Um, someone asks, uh, uh, and I think this is probably a, a relatively straightforward question, but is, um, are safe to fail probes simply like little models to give uh, customers a safe place to see what solves the right problem? More or less, yes. Um, it's meant to be the idea of safe to fail, which comes from um, the Sinofin um, network and Dave Snowden's work. And he intended it that you can test something and if it doesn't work you haven't lost anything or you've lost an hour of work or something like that um, but given what you can reveal in a safe to fail probe um, I think uh, uh, that hour is very 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 well wasted as it were if you can prove something's not going to work. Adrian I, I just want to go back to the previous question and something I didn't say but meant to was 
uh, when you're talking about somebody is wedded to a solution of questioning that person as to why they want that solution. Mm. Because if you can, um, if their answers aren't strong, they themselves will know it. And I think it's just, just a constant asking, you know, we talk about asking why five times. Um, if you, somebody's wedded to a solution and, and they're not giving up on it, uh, at some point, one of the why five whys are going to just say, because that's what I want to do, uh, which I think anyone would accept as a very weak reason for, for doing something. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a tricky one, isn't it, James? Mm. Sometimes because you've you've also got the the organisational politics that's sort of creeping around the edge. Oh, yeah, the way that we're we're sort of navigating through. Mm. Um, so so uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so our next question is: um, everybody has limited resources, uh, so we need to prioritise. Um, do you prioritise solutions? Or do you prioritize problems to solve or both? Um, I would firstly prioritize the problems to solve. Um, the, oh, the, on one of the slides way back there, it talked about why is this important to solve this problem? And I think that's a very significant question to be asking because if we, can probe a solution to say what is the outcome from it. We can we can probe a problem to say what is the outcome from it, and from those outcomes we can prioritise because the outcome is generally speaking we will uh, make more money, we will up our customer service, or we will um, be able to uh, stave off a competitor or whatever the reason. Um, I, yes, I think you do have to prioritise problems. Um, you do have to um, make sure that your resources are being spent on uh, delivering real solutions for real problems that are important problems. Yeah, well, one one thing that struck me as you were speaking there, James, is is I suppose it also um, is important that the problems we're solving are aligned with the organisation's you know stated direction and strategy. Um, rather than going off down, down a rabbit hole and solving something that's, that seems very important now, but is actually, you know, going to be defunct anyway in three, six, 12 months time or whatever. Oh, I, I agree with that. But um, I think it happens sometime that we lose sight of our organization's goals. Yeah. Or I can put that another way and say, we don't, we don't understand the organization's goals clearly enough because I think part of, good management is making sure that everybody knows what your what the organization is trying to achieve not in dilbert-esque type language but in in solid language that says this is what we're trying to achieve and it everybody knows it it's it's on the walls and you know i'm not talking about motivational posters here at all I'm talking about this is what we are trying to achieve this year or over the next next five years and everybody you then are prioritizing against those objectives yeah it's, it's interesting it's it, it was one of the one of the famous manage, management writers and i can never remember the exact quote or, or who said it which isn't very useful but there's a quote that's something along the lines of you can define a business by as, as much as by what it says no to as what it says yes to. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that's a really profound thing because, you know, actually you've got to say no to some opportunities so you can say yes to the ones that are really on point. Um, and, and I guess so the same with problems, I, I guess. So um, excellent. So our next question um, is what are some examples of good BA techniques that help us drill down to the underlying problems? Oh, these are difficult because there's no um, model that's totally helpful. Um, I would suggest the class model or the data model or the entity model, whatever you choose to call it, as a very technologically neutral model. Um, and it's a lot of proponents of, of the data model uh, say that it's actually a model of business policy. So it, it helps you to uh, state what the underlying business policy is. Uh, process models tend to get a little bit 
tangled up with um, with technology because it's all too easy to draw a process model that's got one or two activities in it that are dependent upon a particular technology or something like that. Um, questioning uh, and saying why, and I know it's become a cliche to say ask why five times. Uh, I don't say that. Uh, I say, because I, I really think if you went to somebody and started speaking to them and every time they said something, you ask why five times, they would slap you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's unacceptable. But you ask why again and again and again until you've, or ask why until uh, you've reached the, what you feel is the essence of the problem. Um, and the other thing I guess is, was the same thing of saying to somebody, um, if there were no technology at all, what would this piece of work be doing? You know, in other words, you can't uh, say we've got screens and databases and all that kind of stuff. Tell me what it is without any hint of technology. And that's getting close to the, um, to the essence of the problem. Uh, but it, it, it is unfortunately one of those things where you as a database, uh, data, I'll start, I'll start again where you as a business analyst have to um, keep on questioning until you feel that yes, you have reached the, uh, the absolute bottom, the essence of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the, that, that five whys or, or however many whys, I always think it's ironic that, that it's called five whys as a technique, but it doesn't have to be five and it doesn't mm -hmm. really have to be why. <laughs> so we can soften the questions and uh, maybe to, to add and be interested to get your view on this, James, but some, some techniques that I've become quite um, fond of in, in my practice as a BA. I mean, the fishbone diagram, the Ishikawa diagram can be quite useful, I, I find, alongside five whys to show things visually. Mm -hmm. um, but more recently, and this is, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a, a real proponent of systems thinking. And there's a diagram that comes from uh, the systems dynamic um, school of, of systems thinking called a multiple cause diagram. And, and until I came across it a few years ago, I'd never really, I'd never really seen uh, one before, but as soon as I started using it, it's really intuitive and I think actually easier than a, a, a fishbone diagram. So if you haven't seen a multiple cause diagram, I think mm -hmm. they, they're quite, quite useful as well. As well. well I, I've been using the Sengi diagrams, uh, which is, I think, a similar thing. Um, this is sort of from Peter Sengi's book, and he yeah, yeah. cause and effect and whether it uh, had a lovely thing of whether it creates an equilibrium. Uh, when everything's going on or whether it's a snowballing effect of something something building up. Exactly. So uh, sort of causal loops, reinforcing and balancing causal loops as well, mm -hmm. which I've, I've, I've very, ex ex extremely useful because you can you can find you've either got a virtuous circle or like a doom loop <laughs> if it's, if it's yes. getting bigger and bigger type of thing. So, um, OK, so our next question is, should you revisit at various points of your analysis when you think you have the right solution? And, and the person puts in brackets progressive elaboration. Should you revisit? Yes. Um, I think that to me, one of the important things in agility is that you don't consider something finished ever, that you've decided that you're going to stop working on it, but that doesn't mean you can't go back and revisit later. It's also, um, I think important because we had an earlier question about resources earlier. We don't have the resources. We don't have a lot of resources. Um, we waste too much of it by redoing things when sometimes we can simply modify something and we can bolt something on to something else. Um, I was reading about the, the plane makers and Boeing and Airbus and how some of their popular planes, um, like uh, maybe I shouldn't mention the 737, but uh, <laughs> that plane came into service in 1963. It's been modified and worked over. It's the most popular aeroplane in the world. Currently not, but um, up until the time that they messed up the software, um, by instead of developing a whole new aeroplane at the cost of billions, they kept modifying this one. And um, well, as I said, until the software foul up, it uh, it was extremely popular. But Airbus have done exactly the same thing with their 319 and 320 
uh, to keep them flying for years and years and years. Um, so a lot of the time, I think we should be looking at our systems and going back, revisiting, but also when we're doing business analysis, we should be of half a mind all the time to say, well, you know, maybe we made some assumptions earlier on. I should go back and question them. There is, of course, of course there is a limit. You can't go back to something every day because you'll never progress if you do. But uh, I think we should have the attitude that we can go back to something at any time and, and revisit it because there may be uh, underlying assumptions we made that we've now proven have been incorrect. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting as you were as you were giving that example of the aeroplanes, uh, James. I was I was thinking um, uh, I, I was on a a flight, a long haul flight, a, a while back, and it, it had it had what looked like the first generation entertainment, well, the first individual seat entertainment system, mm -hmm. which looked really old by today's standards, but would have been amazing at the time, and. I wonder, do you think there's a case that actually organizations need to continually listen out for when the problems changed? Because if you're Airbus or Boeing, you can only make those incremental adjustments if you know that the demand and your customer's need is changing. If you ignore it, then you become perhaps the likes of, you know, Blockbuster, Kodak and those sorts of things. Do you think that's a, a sort of fair statement? Oh, well, absolutely, because Airbus and Boeing are constantly, constantly testing the marketplace to say, what are people doing? Because the planes I've been talking about are you know, short to medium haul planes. Um, they're very popular because lots of people are flying those, those kind of distances. And it's changing. The market, the airline market is changing all the time. Uh, they've got to keep track of fashions, uh, where people want to fly to and from. Um, do they want to get on um, big flights or little flights? Or do they want to go to a hub airport, for example? Uh, all these things change constantly. If you look at uh, Amazon as a company, Amazon is a superb company. They really are. Um, they're taking over the world. They're so superb. Uh, not that I'm wanting them to take over the world, but I admire them as a way they do business because they are actually using artificial intelligence to predict what their customers are going to want and how they're going to want it. And so they're constantly, constantly reworking their solutions, their business fulfillment solutions, for example, is the, the one you see the most of, they're constantly reworking them to improve them. And, and you know, Amazon will say, well, if we can get a packet to a customer you know, 10 minutes earlier, that's, that's a bonus for us. That's what we're trying to, uh, trying to do if we can get it out of our warehouse five minutes earlier we'll we'll rework the system in order to uh, to be able to do that so they are constantly looking ahead for what people want and i think any good business should be doing exactly the same thing um and as an example um i, I pointed the the new um financial technological banks, uh, the Monzos and so forth mm. how they're beginning to eat into the traditional banking market and at some point, um, inertia will fade away and they will be, um, they'll become much, much, much bigger, maybe even majority banks. So, but they're looking all the time to what, what customers are wanting, what, what changes they have to make in order to, um, in order to meet those customer demands. That, that's a really exa a good example, actually, because I, I, um, I, you know, I fairly recently got a, Mo a Monzo account and, and I know there are others, but Monzo just happens to be the one I... I, I tried out and I found, as I guess you probably did, James, they've completely rethought through the problem of how do I, how do I um, identify the customer and, and how do I know my customer? Because the last time I went to open with a traditional bank, bank which admittedly was a long, long time ago, um, you know, it was, it was physically going in and proving who I am, whereas actually Monzo have worked out a way of doing it where I don't have to go anywhere or, or send anything physical or have a physical signature, which I thought was, you know, it for me infinitely preferable <laughs> well i thought it was a staggering change of attitude that monzo have that they treat you as a friend from day one but if you go to one of the major banks and want to open an account you are treated as an enemy uh, as a potential money launderer um and invited to prove otherwise and uh, i just find that such an unfriendly attitude that um 
I really don't like it. But uh, no, I think Monzo are great. Uh, everything. If you read their blog, they've got some uh, great stuff going on there. Yeah. And um, the coolest thing of all, Adrian, is if you buy something using a Monzo card, it uh, your Apple Watch goes ka-ching and the purchase shows up on the watch. <laughs> Which again, the Apple Watch is, is solving all sorts of problems in new ways as well. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, someone's written in with a, with a, 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 it's a comment rather than a question, but it's one that's quite interesting. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the comment is, I worked on a few Y2K projects and then some non-Y2K projects. I was very surprised on the, the non-Y2K projects to find they were in flight without even beginning to discover what the problem was. And that's, that's a, an, an interesting comparison because I suppose with, with Y2K there was a fairly clear um, a fairly clear problem with a fairly clear deadline, um, but but not 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 so much on other other situations. Well, thank you, the person that uh, that wrote that one is. I think it's a lovely example. Um, and yes, it was true. The Y two K problem was very easy to define, um, and I guess it it also there was something about Y two K which is a very focused deadline. Whereas um, other times we know we just make the deadline up, but uh, no, I think it's I think it's a lovely comment. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and um, I, I, and I know often uh, often it, it's it's sort of ironic, isn't it? Because most organisations actually did a reasonable job of getting stuff over the line in advance of Y two K. There were always there was always sweep up after, but, mm -hmm. but that's sometimes used as a well, it was all a big you know a big um, fuss over nothing, but it's like. No, there was investment in in change, which meant that there wasn't a problem. <laughs> but <Yes>. I digress. <laughs> um, okay, our next question is: Who generates the alternatives? Um, I'm guessing co-creation with stakeholders to make sure you're going in the right direction. Absolutely, um, I, I see the business analysts as being um, people who should have creative um, inclinations. Let's say I'm not wanting a uh, not necessarily thinking of the BA as being the inventive genius, but uh, the BA being an innovative sort of person working with the stakeholders, with the real, if possible, with the real customers, um, and together as a, as a group coming up with the alternative saying, how can we solve this problem? We're not going to stop at one solution. We're going to, uh, to go on and find other solutions. And sort of do that for as long as it's productive, because if, obviously if you stop coming up with good solutions, then you, you stop it at that point. But yes, very much having um, stakeholder, real customer involvement. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay. So our next question is um, ooh, a, a very good, probably, quite a, a, probably an even more tricky one, actually, is how do you prevent confirmation bias when designing probes? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. I, I missed a word there. Would you mind repeating the question, Adrian? No problem. So the, the question is, um, how do you prevent confirmation bias when designing probes or safe to fail probes? So I'm, I'm interpreting this as the sort of cognitive bias of, of confirmation bias. Yes, no, I heard you pronounce the word bias as buyers, and I didn't know oh, right. what confirmation <laughs> buyers were. Um, how do you permit, uh, it's, it's very difficult because, uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes uh, this sort of stuff is like religion to people and, and um, logic doesn't always work. Um, the thing I would always do is constantly ask people why you know, do the five whys. Why do you want this solution? Why are you sticking up for this one? You know, why is it important to build? Why do you think it's important to build a database? What's it going to uh, to deal uh, with you? But equally, there will be ego involved because if somebody's proposed a solution, they would be willing to or very anxious to promote it. And whoever proposed the original assumed solution. I think would be very wanting to um, defend it. Yeah. Uh, so it's not it's not always easy to bring this about. Uh, however, if you've got some, and you have been able to come up with some good alternative solutions, it's worth doing it, going through the um, uh, the probing process, because you're 
likely to demonstrate that one of these solutions is in fact better than the, the other and is actually going to give you a much better outcome. And if you're probing with the customers involved, it's very hard if the customers are suddenly standing up and cheering and saying, yes, that's a solution. That really solves our problem. You do something for us that um, we can't currently do and we want to do. Um, you know, that's a, it's a very hard argument to overcome. So having the customers there, um, I, I think is a very, very important part of it. Absolutely, because if they become cheerleaders for a you know a, a particular option, then then that that really carries it through. So, okay, um, our next question reflects and builds upon an earlier question. So we spoke earlier about um, how can we, essentially how can we get people to listen if they've got a presumed solution? How can we get them to step back? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read the, the question out in full, uh, but I think there's an interpretation on it. So the full question is, what do you do when clients come with the assumed solutions and expect you to work with them? The angle I want to add to that, but sort of braiding in with that is if we're external, so I know both you, know, you and I tend to be parachuted in, um, that does create a different dynamic. So what would you say if you're an external consultant, contractor, whatever, someone's got a solution in mind you feel that the analysis hasn't been done would you would you you know would you question in the same way that you've you've suggested or would anything be different in that not moment? not quite as aggressively but i would ask the client that's come to you um is he or she absolutely certain that it is going to solve the right problem because um, the client's presented you with a solution but hasn't yet stated what the problem is and so um, if you're not going to explore the problem, then you, the, I, t I take it you're a, um, a contractor or a software house building um, solutions for people, um, then you've really got to say, well, I can't you know, completely be responsible for the outcome of all this because you're refusing to tell me what the problem is that we're solving. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to delay things, uh, not that I want to, you know, run up my bill by uh, spending weeks exploring the problem. It's, I want to be certain that when we finish this, that you have the right, you have your com correct problem solved uh, and not just have a solution in your hand. Otherwise it, uh, it could be very, very unsatisfactory and unnecessarily expensive when you realize you've got to turn around and modify the solution we delivered because it doesn't, doesn't solve the right problem. Yeah, and, and, and just uh, reflecting on what you've said there, James, we've probably all seen situations where an organisation an organization will blame a supplier for situations like that because it's, oh, yeah. it's politically more convenient. So if, you, if, if, if someone finds themselves in their supplier's shoes, maybe, maybe being un, you know, unpopular in the short term might be worth the longer term gain. <laughs> Oh, I, I think so, because um, yes, if the solution doesn't work, if the solution you deliver doesn't work, you will be blamed, um, even though they may have flat refused to tell you what the problem they're, they're trying to solve. It's, um, it's just one of those difficult things. Definitely, definitely. Okay, well, the questions are still coming in thick and fast, so we will cover as many as we can. Um, so our next question is, um, I'm interested how we can get the right balance in solution options between the financial business case, brackets, costs and benefits, and solving the root cause of the customer issue, which may be less tangible. So that's a fairly broad question around how we can get the right balance in, I, I guess, knowing we've got the right number of solution options, um, which will ultimately meet a business case and and because uh, re reflecting on this we could carry on probing forever um, that they can't I guess there comes a point of, of diminishing returns <laughs> um, yes it, all of this is not meant to take a long time it, it should be quick it, it really really should be quick um, I just want to go back to that bit of the question about um, the customer's real problem, which might be touchy-feely, I'm going to suggest no, it's not, because if the customer has a problem, it's because he, she needs to be able to do something that they can't currently do. Mm. And 
or they want to be able to do something that they can't currently do, or they want something they don't care. That's sort of the, um, the problem. Now, when somebody says, I want an iPad, um, there are two reasons for wanting an iPad. Uh, one is just to have one and you know, do the normal iPad-y stuff. Um, the other is that they may see it as a solution to their problem because they can run an app on it and carry the iPad around. But I'm going to say that's jumping into a solution before you've got the, um, the real problem. However, if I just go back to the idea that a customer's problem, if solved, must produce some tangible benefit. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that they just feel better. However, if this is in a business situation, you have to say, is there a benefit to me of people feeling better? Now, a lot of the time, yes, there is. Um, you know, you and I, Adrian, were discussing Monzo Bank. I feel really good about that bank. I'm, I'm, I use it because I like it. Um, uh, you know, I love the color of the card. I feel good about it. I feel good about what they're doing. And so for me, that means I open an account with, with Monzo. Um, so it's not Monzo want the world to feel good. Uh, they want the world to feel good so that they will come and um, patronize their, their bank. So I'm going to say with the solution to any problem, there should be some tangible benefit that's able to be um, measured in some way. Because if you really can't measure it, I'm going to say maybe we haven't got to the um, the underlying problem. Uh, absolutely, because we haven't got. Does that make sense? It, it does, because without that, we haven't got the the success criteria of knowing when it's solved yeah. in a way. So, okay, um, our next question is a really short one, and it's probably one I, I guess that can be answered in a word, which is: Are these rules and approaches covered in the book? No. Um, the approaches are uh, the rules uh, I came up with just for this webinar because I thought it's better to be able to say one, two. You normally you're supposed to say one, two, three, but I overstepped myself and said one, two, three, up to seven. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to break the webinar up and say these are seven rules for doing things. Um, of course, if you don't have the number three, you have to have the number seven. Anything in between is just, <laughs> it's just an old presentation thing. Uh, however, the idea of generating um, solutions, probing, all this kind of stuff, uh, yes, uh, all of that is, is covered in the book. Fantastic. Um, so we, we still have six questions outstanding, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry for everyone uh, on the line. We, we, we won't be able to cover all of them. We'll cover one final question. Um, James, if people haven't been able to have their question answered live, are, are you happy for them to drop you a quick email? Sure, sure, absolutely. Fan fantastic. So um, a final question is, can these step, seven steps be used for small problems and large problems? Um, and do you have any suggestions for dealing with the time constraints? Um, yes, I think they can be used on big and small. Uh, obviously, it takes longer for big problems, and big problems are much, much more subtle, much more deep, uh, and they simply take longer uh, because typically they have more components and they become much more complicated because of their uh, more components making up the, uh, up the problem. Uh, how to deal with time constraints? Um, the answer is you've got to fit it in the best you can because, you know, it'd be lovely to have a year to sit around and talk about alternative solutions and probe and so forth. We just don't have it. So you have to limit your ambitions here and say, well, gee, you know, we've only got a few days here. Let's just generate three really good alternatives and probe those. Or, no, this is a very important mission critical solution for a big organization. Let's, let's take a week, let's take a month and, and, um, and do this properly. So I think it's going to depend very much on the size of the problem and the resources you've got, because clearly you can't spend more resources than you, than you have. Absolutely. So we come back to the, the prioritization again. Mm. So. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, James. I think, is there a final slide um, after this one, if I 
if I remember. Ah, thank you. There it is. There it is. Thank you. So, uh, so uh, the final thing to say is is a massive thank you to to you, James, for for putting the, the, this this webinar on. I, I mean, just by the level of engagement we've had from the audience, I, I know this has really resonated. And, and I know, you know, as, as, as a BA, it is a topic that is so on point, it's so relevant for, uh, for what we do. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for putting this together. And, 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 and I hope your throat gets better soon. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Absolutely. And um, thank you for everyone that, that attended live. Um, we do have two other webinars coming up. Um, if you're attending live, when you hit the exit button, there'll be a link where you can immediately sign up for these. Um, on Wednesday, the 24th of April, we have a session on innovative elicitation. Now, again, elicitation is a topic that we probably know so well as BAs, but how often do we go back and look at some of the innovative and fundamental sides? Um, so that's with Jamie Champagne of Champagne Collaboration, so do take a look at that one. And in June, on Thursday, the, the June the 13th, we have a session entitled The Mindful BA, Building Resilience Through Mindfulness with uh, Kathy Burkage of Mind at Work Consulting. So if you've ever found yourself getting stressed because stakeholders are, you know, new stakeholders and deadlines, that would be one to check out as well. So um, a massive thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, thank you uh, again, James, and hope to catch you all on a webinar soon. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Bye.